So anything you can tell us about the upcoming Bon Jovi tour? Is John still in the band? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or our other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rohde. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Rohde, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy the show. Everett Bradley is a Grammy-nominated singer, songwriter, dancer, choreographer, multi-instrumentalist, and band leader. He's worked with Carly Simon, Daryl Hall, John Bon Jovi, Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band, Cyndi Lauper, and Joey Ramone. <laughs> you imagine doing a Cindy Lauper, Joey Ramone album? <laughs> <laughs> hey man, did, but that would be a a really... <laughs> Anything can happen. Exactly, so, anything. How neat would that have been? My God. All right. He is the musical director for the off-Broadway show Stomp, which I think is so freaking cool, Everett. <laughs> and he wrote for Swing. Rich Dart is a percussionist. He has played with the Monkees, Lionel Hampton, Greg Piccolo, Mark Lindsay from Paul Revere and the Raiders. And he's also done some Broadway stuff, including Avenue Q. Oh. So to open this up, my question here first will be for Rich. And mm -hmm. did you have, since you are a massive Monkees fan that you've always said you are, yes. did you ever uh, think about talking to them about the song title Magdalena and I? And letting them know that it really should be, or no, so the song is me and Magdalena. <laughs> you ever think about letting them know that it really should be Magdalena and I? No, never even occurred to me. But uh, Ben Gibbard wrote that tune. So I looked that up and that was interesting. So how did the Death Cab for Cutie guy find hmm. the monkeys? Or how did that well, all come about? What happened was, uh, I don't even remember what year that came out. but um, Really pretty song, by the way. It's a beautiful song. It's amazing. It is, yeah. song. Uh, so uh, our producer and manager, Andrew Sandoval, who's also this major archivist in the music world, like any reissue of a 60s group like the Turtles or the Kinks or whatever, he's behind all that. And he's been working on archiving monkey stuff. And lo and behold, he came across all these unfinished recordings from the 60s that they never oh. completed. That's so cool. his idea was let's make an album. And he went to uh, Adam Schlesinger, late great Adam Schlesinger to help him produce it. And Adam said, you know, there's a million bands in the world that were inspired by the monkeys. And I know a bunch of songwriters would love to contribute new songs to the monkeys. So could we make this an album where it's half and half, half yeah. the songs that didn't get finished, half new songs. And that's, that's how that happened. It's a neat thing. I loved it. I, I just, it was so unexpected as I was looking through, honestly, Spotify and the, you, you have your top songs with listens. That song was one of the top ones of the monkeys. And I'm like, I don't know that one. And so when I clicked on it and then I typed who wrote it, I'm like, God damn Google. <laughs> Cause I'm like, there's no way it was death cap for cutie guy. Yeah, and, no, uh, it was. It was Ben Gibber. He was a huge monkeys fan. Yeah. A huge fan. We did a couple shows with him. That's uh, super fun stuff. So, all right. So uh, one of the things I like to try and do is we got uh, for a younger audience, you know, I, I'm, there's a kid in Alaska who wrote to me and he wants to get the hell out of Alaska. I like Alaska, <laughs> by the way, I found Alaska very nice, but he wants to get out of there and he wanted to know what, you know, what he could do uh, uh, in music and stuff. So what was interesting to to me about you guys is looking, uh, reading up on you a little bit. I asked people if their parents were supportive of their careers. So, uh, I already know a little bit because I read about you guys, but uh, with, with you, Everett, I'll start. So, so uh, dad really wanted you to be, uh, I'm going to say a scholar, if that's fair. And mom wanted you to entertain your artistic sides, if that's fair. And that's fair. so with Rich, I think you kind of had the same thing. Your parents wanted to make sure 
that if music didn't really work out, there would be some other avenues for you to pursue in life. Yes. So, um, you know, what would you both say with your parents guiding towards that? You, Everett, kind of made it clear that you kind of guided yourself too. <laughs> and you were all over the place with the football and the music and everything. I mean, you were like an interesting kid, man. And then your career has really turned out to be really interesting too. So I don't think you've changed a lot. So I think we need to do a musical about football. With, with Rich. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you're little guys, you know, what, what were you thinking at the time when, when your parents were making you study uh, other things and you wanted, you knew you wanted to be a musician, I'm assuming. Uh, what were your guys' thoughts, Rich? What, where did you, uh, where was your headspace then? Um, well, they supported me being a musician from the start, I, I come from a background of musicians. I had a, a, a great uncle who worked with Artie Shaw. Oh. And I have an uncle who has played, you know, guitar and rock bands for his whole life in local bars and stuff like that. Um, my sister is a choreographer and dancer. So they're very supportive of the arts. My dad always wanted to be an actor, but that didn't work out. Uh, he ended up being a banker. So, oh. you know. I guess they go in hand in hand. I don't know. Is he interested in funding a musical? <laughs> Ever? <laughs> well, he would be if he were alive, I'm sure. But, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. You didn't know that. Um, so when it came time to go to school, to study in college, uh, I wanted to be a you know, music major. I wanted to do music performance. And my parents were pretty adamant that I should be in music education. Because... Oh. You know, they were realists and um, being a parent now, I totally get that. So they let me study music as long as I was studying music education. Mm. Uh, what happened was I skipped all my education classes to practice. So uh, the faculty all got the, together and said, maybe you should be a performance major. And voila, my parents weren't too happy with that, but I think I've done okay. I think you've done okay too. <laughs> What about you, Everett? How did this all go well, down? Was I there mean, like arguments? I there? ended up the same as Rich there, but my the beginning of it was quite different. I didn't have, you know, art sort of dancing around in my family at all, except I had a sister that played saxophone. But my mom recognized early on that I was I had a real spirit and interest for music, and she got me a piano against my dad's will, like they fought over it oh, wow. like my dad was like I knew you shouldn't have gotten that piano oh look at him like it made him angry that I was so happy about it <laughs> it's crazy because he wanted he did he you know he's like an old southern guy and he wants the best for his kids he wants us to be doctors and lawyers and have money and you know and not get sucked up into things that won't uh, allow me to be successful but my mother did not refuse to refuse to listen to him. And so um, I'll spare you of all the crazy details, but <laughs> I ended up having to attach education to music. And that's how I was able to, to get out of the house. <laughs> basically. <laughs> do you still have a piano in your house? I do. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my parents are gone, but I, I, we still have that piano in the family. How good of an athlete were you? Were you on par with your brother? Like, was he always just Not an amazing? Quite player? on par with him, but you know, I was slated to be the next Bradley, you know, athlete to like, you know, leave Muncie, Indiana. I got um, offers from smaller colleges uh, in the Midwest to play football, and uh, I just ignored them all. Your brother's <laughs> a little older than you, then. Yeah, he's eight years older, actually. His brother was on the Detroit Lions, Rich. That's why I bring him. Ah, wow. That's awesome. Nick Cole. Yeah. That's he, he was at Notre Dame during the Air Parsesian years, Dan Devine. If you follow coaches, um, he still holds records at Notre Dame. But yes, he played for the Lions for many years. Wow. That's, that's cool. Awesome. All right. So percussion, you guys both are percussionists. So let's jump into it. So uh, ever, you are the first. He's like a real percussionist. <laughs> real, <laughs> he's a real deal. Is that, 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 that. is that what you studied in school? Richard? Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 I was a, a voice major. 
Oh wow! Oh. See, well, that's amazing to me because yeah. I can't sing worth the with a doohickey. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because I was singing in bands, and I was in a funk band. They're like, and they had also a female singer. So all the guys were like, "Can you be doing something when you're not singing lead?" So I went and got a set of congas, and worked it out. And then when I got to New York, it became a source of survival that How I could sing. How did you get into the musical and, like, theater I, stuff, Everett? Because I was doing musical theater in high school as well. And so it was already lingering in there. And I dabbled in it in college. Didn't do shows per se, but I was in a, a, a show choir that did a lot of theater repertoire. So, um, yeah. But Stomp was sort of my entrance into New York theater, which is perfect, you know, being a percussionist and oh, yeah. a mover and, um, and it just being off Broadway, it sort of helped insert myself into that world. Did you guys have any like shenanigans? Did you guys play jokes on each other during the, uh, during the run or anything like that? Kind of like with the music industry, we... I don't want to say us roadies or jackasses because we're not, but we, 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 we do like to, we do like to fuck with each other a little bit. So I, did you guys have the, did you have the same experiences while in the, the musical genre? Um, I don't quite know what you mean. You mean on stage kind of stuff? Yeah, we play jokes and stuff. Any kind of smart, uh, we call, I call it wind-ups. So I don't know if they had any wind-ups. Oh, my. well, that's so interesting that you say that because in Stomp, the directors want us to play jokes on each other and want us to wind each other up because it makes the show more interesting because a lot of it's improv. Wow. Oh, wow. That's different. Yeah. So then you really got to be creative to come up with new crap to mess with the next guy. Yeah. These musical theaters are so far ahead of their time. <laughs> is, is like, it's set up as restrictions. Like they do say things like you have to play those three pots and it has to be all triplets and it has to be within four bars and then that's it wow so then within that then you can like play them in any order you can like leave out beats you can like ah. not, yeah so and that's what keeps the show interesting and that's why it's still playing remarkable uh, yeah that's neat so literally every show is different for real yep yep Oh, uh, cool. I think stomp like a bunch of times. I never even noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> uh, so you're the first percussionist for Bruce Springsteen then, Everett? I guess so. Wow. Yeah. I mean, cool. hand percussion, not drum kit. Yes. Wow. I am. Uh, yeah, that's a crazy story. So, how, yeah, how did you get the gig? And then, you know, what's it like? performing next to bruce springsteen when you're you don't know him before you walk yeah, in this is cold but right? well, i got hired in um like 2011 fall of 2011 to play for a benefit and the musical director sent me all the music to learn he wanted me to sing and play percussion which i often do and uh i noticed that all the songs were bruce springsteen songs so i called him back and I'm like dude what's happening <laughs> and he said that not to tell anyone, but Bruce is doing a fundraiser for his kids' uh, school, Boston College, because he started a scholarship fund there. So we did a gig at the Stone Pony. I learned all the songs. I got to the sound check. My percussion setup was at the front of the stage. So, you know, we all know that usually I, you set up next to the drummer. It was at the front of the stage, so I went to the musical director. I'm like, what's going on here? Like, why am I at the front? He goes, oh, I just thought it would be fun for Bruce, you know, to hang out with you. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> Bruce shows up for the sound check, doesn't give me any love. He's not paying any attention to me, really. He's just listening to the band to make sure that everyone knows their parts. And then, but come showtime, He's all over me. He has his hand around my, uh, his arm around me. He's playing percussion with me. We're like sharing the mic, singing together. Like, and I, you know, I'm the kind of performer, I'm not scared. Like, if, you know, once the performance starts, I go in. So I totally pushed back. And then in January of 2012, 
he, uh, his management called and they said that Bruce is interested in having a percussionist and he really had a good time with you and wants to know if you can come in and, as an experiment to play with the band just to see how it would might sound. I'm like, sure. And they said, so can you come in on uh, Wednesday? I think it was. And I said, no. And they're like, really? <laughs> I said, because <laughs> I am flying to Japan with Hall & Oates on that oh, day. Oh, well, that's kind of cool too, but... Uh, yeah. I mean, and they, oof. <laughs> they asked, they're like, so can you delay your trip a day? Because, you know, usually you give, you get a couple of days to like acclimate yourself into a new country like that. And I said, no. And part of it too is like, I'm like one of those guys that once I make a commitment, I keep it, you know? So because um, Daryl Hall's scary, where you're like, no. <laughs> That's a whole other story. <laughs> no, be my ass. I ain't doing that. <laughs> but while I was, and I hung up the phone, I'm like, oh, Everett, geez, like, some time to like be all like Mr. Goody Two Shoes about everything. It's Bruce Springsteen. So I go to Japan a week into the tour. I get an email from the management and they said, Can you take a picture of your percussion setup? Email it to us and call us when you get back. And I'm like, Well, that sounds like a good sign. Can't be bad, right? Yeah. Right. I get back and I call the management and they said that. Um, it's not like Bruce was auditioning other percussions. He was so impressed with your commitment that he decided to wait for you. Wow. Cool. wow. Right? Man. So he postponed like dates and stuff to make sure you were on board? Well, th there were no dates, but, you know, he was. So the, in the poor guys are sitting there rehearsing, like, who the hell is this Everett guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just like kept the spot open. And so, and I even walked into the rehearsal. They were. I kept asking for material. What kind of gear should I bring? They're like, don't worry about anything. No, you don't need to hear any material. I walk in, they have an exact replica of my setup. Wow. To the height. It's crazy. And they didn't send me any songs because if you know Springsteen, there's a lot of audibles. Sure. So, so they wanted to see what I would do. On who was the feet. tech who set up the percussion? Do you remember? uh you don't have uh, to but if you do it'd be a nice little shout out that would be a good shout out it would be cool um, yeah. oh my god i can't believe he's gonna kill me bob bob weber bob weber all right thank you bob yes. <laughs> anyway <laughs> he's the one that hooked me up That's so really um neat. but yeah yeah it was a good story and uh it is I was a good story to come in the band yeah the weird thing was that they, my setup was right where um, Clarence used to stand on stage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That only lasted like a day. And then psh, they switched everyone around. That's good. That would be a little awkward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk totally about standing awkward. in the guy's shoes. You literally are. Uh, right. <laughs> exactly. I liked them too. I liked them too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Rich. So, Rich, so, uh, I see. Uh, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go, go, go. I'm looking at Rich's room, and I see that there is. Is that? Um, are those bells back there? Yeah. In the blue like case. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! It looks amazing. Yeah. They look old too. Uh, they're 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 not the greatest ones. They're an old set of Jenkos from like I think the 60s or 70s. That's but, uh, so they cool. get me by. I'm working on. I've got a symphony gig this week, so I'm working on. Something. Oh, what? Where's the symphony gig? I play with the, the Greater Bridgeport Symphony in Connecticut. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow. Is it a Christmas concert? It is. Well, it's kind of half and half. So they're doing a Mendelssohn piece that I'm not on, and then oh. they're doing a whole bunch of Christmas stuff after that. Nice. Yeah. Wow. That's so fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Much yeah. respect for any kind of orchestral percussion playing it's so deep yeah uh, will the bar be open during the mendelssohn stuff so that you <laughs> have something to do the beauty of that is it's it's in the first half so i don't have to show up till the second half and i'm not principal so i don't have to bring any gear or set anything up are they gonna play the song tinsel that everett wrote hey oh. maybe do that they should do that they should do that i'll, I'll bring it up with the md 
think. Well, <laughs> right, I, I told you he'd be a good guy, Everett. I told you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm amazed. Like the way the notes look on the paper is so deep. In my notes, when I like do a percussion gig with a pop gig, it's like play tambourine and shake ass for a fun. <laughs> In no particular order. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> for everyone, shake your ass, play some tambourine. <laughs> That's great. Uh, when I, when I, when I like outside of that, like from pop stuff, I mean, my notes are just like, you know, I write one groove and then write, you know, just words, you know, just keep doing that ad nauseum. And, you know, yeah, exactly. funky, funky ass funk is, is one of my favorites that I like to ride. So, and did you play for Avenue Q like since inception? Like, no. So the first drummer for having a cue is a guy named Michael Kreuter. Uh, and I came in as a sub and I ended up being the Monday night guy because oh, uh, wow. Monday nights are when most shows are dark. So all the musicians get other gigs, but Q oh, right. on Monday nights. So I was there every Monday and then I started doing Mondays and Thursdays. And then I started doing Monday, Thursday and weekends. And then I did the first national tour for two years. Oh, oh wow. wow. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that show so much. The show was, great. was that before Monkeys? That's that's not. That was three Monkeys. Well, so here's here's the story about Monkeys, and I'll give yeah. you a version. So I was working at a place up here in Connecticut called the Goodspeed Opera House. Yeah. It was famous for workshopping shows at Go Yeah. Opera. And uh, they had a production of Pippin come through. And since I was the second call guy, I wasn't the first call guy, when they took the show Pippin on the road, I was the guy that got the gig because they can't take the first call guy. So I was, I split the book with the first call guy for the run here in Connecticut. Mickey Dolenz was in Pippin as King Charlemagne. So when we were on the road, we were on the road for four months with that. Him and I became extremely good friends. Extremely and you're good. already, you're a big Monkees fan though. I'm a huge Monkees fan. I grew up with their posters on my walls. So were you like dorky around them or you were playing it cool? No, I made them? every effort not to be a dork. Okay. <laughs> i made every effort to ask him about like hey uh what was it like when sergeant peppers came out and stuff like that rather than so tell me about the monkeys and stuff let's like talk that. notre dame football yeah exactly <laughs> which i know nothing about <laughs> i know very little about sports which is bizarre because i play in a hockey band called the zambonis but that's i another... saw that actually and it was pretty fun <laughs> <laughs> love love so anyway mickey was in the show we got to be good friends uh and, you know, he said, hey, if I ever need you, can I call you? I said, yes. And he called me and I said, I just signed a contract to do the first national tour of Avenue Q. I'm going to be gone. At the time, I said, I'm going to be gone for a year. He said, well, what call me. What the hell's wrong with you guys? Both of you guys get these super cool gigs. And you're like, nope. I'm a percussionist first and foremost. I have rules and standards. Well, <laughs> Avenue Q was a solid gig for a year. And my wife and I really needed to buy a house. So. <laughs> there you go there you go not yeah, to right. sound you know like a woman of the evening or something but uh <laughs> so um then i ended up signing a contract for the second year of q and on the day i came home from q mickey called me and hired me to be in his group do you think he was watching the performance schedule yes i kept asking <laughs> about it <laughs> that's cool man that's really neat yeah that and then that very cool. the band became the monkeys band so have you found that during any of the performances they're playing any of the song wrong? I asked because I had one of this once and it was a, I, I, I think it was with Elton John's band. And I know it was actually. And he, uh, he told one of the guys in the band, he was like, you know, you're not, no, I'm wrong. It's with Kiss. I'm wrong. It was Kiss. Like, okay. Not that the Elton John and Kiss are that similar. They're not. I know. But it was one of the guys in Kiss and they're like, you're not playing the song right. And he's like, I fucking wrote it. He goes, well, you can play it any way you want, but that's not the way. It plays and they came back and he's like, I'm not playing the wrong side. I haven't even noticed the whole goddamn tour, something like that. So did you wow. have anything like that with monkeys? Cause it's been a, although I think Dolan's has toured like pretty consistently. Yeah. Over, yeah. He's the only monkey that has toured every monkeys tour, including the final one that we just finished. So he's as a big fan, what was it like seeing Nazmuth play for the first time with them in all those years? I mean, you must have been like up all night. It's really a great yeah. moment. Yeah, well, yeah. so when we became the Monkees Band, uh, it was Nez's first time back in 2012. And he hadn't played with them all except like a couple gigs here and there uh, as a full-time member since 1967. 
Wow. wow. And uh, so it was a little intimidating because he could be very intimidating at times. And he was one of those guys that he didn't care how, like similar to your story, it was never, we're playing the song wrong. It's why are we playing it the same way? Let's try to change oh. things up. Well, whereas, it's his mom, who was the whiteout lady, right? That's yeah, Nesmith. Okay. Whiteout, yeah. So whereas when I got hired for Mickey's band, the big focus was on going back to the original records and making them sound just like the records, which is one of the reasons Mickey really wanted me. Because when you play on Broadway, especially as a sub, your job is to sound exactly like the guy that you're replacing so that the people up on stage don't get screwed up. So he knew that I could replicate another person's performance. Not that I should be Hal Blaine or Fast Eddie Ho or any of those guys, but you know, play those parts the way they were played and then add my own little flair to it. Um, so going into that Monkeys tour, we were all kind of like, okay, well, I learned all the Nesmith tunes the same way. And Nes was like, no, no, we're gonna do this one this way. And we're gonna change this this way. And he always pushed for that. <clears throat> and then you had our producer who was wanting it to be more original, but our producer would also listen to Nes. And so it was kind of like this weird give and take between the two of them. And being the huge fan, I was always the guy that got thrown in the middle of it. Because Nez would come to me and say, well, I want this to be like Buddy Holly and I want this to be Latin. And then the producer would say, well, I think the fans would like it this way or that way. <clears throat> and they would butt heads and eventually it would be like, well, Rich, you're the Monkees fan. How do you think you should go? You should go. And I'd be like, don't throw me under the bus, man. <laughs> I don't want to get fired from any of you. <laughs> um, but it, especially the last tour. Uh, we really, the whole band in general branched out on a lot of stuff. And I think, you know, Nez really loved that. I and mean, we went out on a, on a high note. Well, wow, that's wonderful and well-deserved. Yeah. I had seen some kind of article years ago where you know, he was very quiet about who he was and his hairstylist had been his hairstylist for like decades and never knew who he was in the monkeys ever. I heard that story too, yeah. Nuts. How could you? Because, you know, the hairstylist is sort of like the person that you just vent to. I think that's not that I know. I, <laughs> <laughs> I got you guys. But nonetheless, I, uh, you know, that's the thing. You know, you talk to himself. I mean, what would Mike Nesmith talk to the hairstylist about? Like, it's a beautiful day here today, you know. Yeah. He, he Have you listened to Tinsel yet? It's a great song. <laughs> <laughs> now I really want to go and listen to Tinsel. Oh, I got to. Yeah, I got to. It's really I good. I got to listen to Tinsel. Everett's new song. It's awesome. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So um, Sean Pelton. So he, this guy's your buddy, bud. This guy's really helped you out, Everett, like through thick and thin type thing. So he got you, he, he took you out of musical theater. Or where does he come into play? And Sean is involved in Saturday Night Live, Rich. Oh, yeah. wow. Very cool. Just, yeah. Really cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, I'm sitting there going, I know that name. I know that name. Yeah, of course. He's the SNL guy. Yeah. Sean and I went to college together. We were freshmen at Indiana University. Oh. And I went more musical theater pop. He went more jazz. And, and then we ended up in the same funk band. And oh, that's that how we cool. <laughs> came back together. And I left Bloomington, Indiana and went moved to LA for about eight months. And I get a, a phone call from Sean that there's some guy named John Eddy that is recording at John Cougar Mellencamp's studio. Oh. And he's scoping out bands because he's trying to put a, a touring band together. Did and you so tell him you were busy <laughs> with some other projects? <laughs> you want to play to Japan? <laughs> <laughs> so he found Sean. So, and by the way, John Eddy was um, on CBS Records and he was slated to be the new young Springsteen because he was like from South Jersey. So, um, uh, so he found Sean and he asked Sean, do you know any black guys who sing and play percussion? <laughs> Sean said, look no further i know the perfect dude he called me in la he's like pack your shit you're coming on the road with me so i did and we did the the kinks 
last tour we opened up for them oh, and wow. we did we opened up for the bangles their last tour wow. as well yeah and so that is how we sort of came together then we ended up moving to new york city together and we were roommates for five years and then uh he got snl and i got into stomp and then <laughs> like that was sort of yeah. but i just saw sean actually three days ago oh. because, and this is a kooky story, but um, Hall & Oates needed subs for their gig at the Beacon Theater. And so Sean came in for Brian Dunn and I came in for Porter Carroll and subbed on percussion and we just played with them together. We need to get just... you on Daryl's house. I'm addicted. I love the show, man. I've been on it. I was there from the very beginning. Oh. Which one? Oh, Did you do the one with CeeLo? <laughs> no. That is when I went to Bruce Springsteen. I missed that show. That, is, that was the one I missed. But I did a lot of them there. That were, it was a very, very cool show. It's and such I, a cool it, show. I was just asking him. I'm like, you need to rekindle that. Like, I don't know what happened. Maybe it was the pandemic that sort of halted all production on it. Well, it's probably a heck of but, a lot of work for him, too. He's learning a lot of songs, like, a lot of the time. Yeah. But it's so much fun as a viewer to watch these guys. Uh, the, it, incredible. So much. In, I really like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'll regret if I don't ask you about Cindy Lauper, because I, I love her. <laughs> she's, my mon she's my monkeys. I think she's the shit. Oh, yeah. I think she's amazing. She's pretty badass. Actually. She's so badass. So what's it like performing with her? I mean, was it, it it's just, I don't know. My hair would stand on end. The arm hair. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's an incredible singer, like first and foremost. And she, um, it's really important to her and she works at hard at maintaining it. And uh, so I, I give her a lot of respect for that. And she's a really hard worker. Yeah, um, you know, like in between doing her own thing, being able to crank out Kinky Boots, which was incredible. Such and a good I, show. Part of that too, I was she um, hired me to sing some of the songs that she was writing because she needed to hear it on a male voice. So that was really cool. But I I'd met her before that when uh, she did a, a record, a single called "The World Is Stone." Okay, and I sang on that. And that's how we, we knew each other. And I did a couple live performances with her as well, like track dates, like in clubs and stuff like that. That's really neat. Uh, yeah, yeah, she's a great artist. She's so incredible. I just, she's so unusual. Hey. <laughs> she's, she's fantastic. So exactly. when I was putting together this podcast, I was at my buddy's house. My buddy has little kids now. I'm at that age where a lot of my friends have little kids. And so uh, the little girls got together and they came up with a question that I ask everybody who comes on. And the question is, when did you first feel famous? If you don't want to go down the road of fame, that's totally fine with me. Maybe pick a moment in your career that is worth mentioning that was pivotal, that meant something to you, what would be a uh, kernel that you guys would choose uh, to tell me about? Wow. That's a tough one. That is a tough feel, one. You have all. to define famous, actually. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, I have a couple of them. One of which is when uh, I played Jesus in Godspell in high school. Mm -hmm. And the high school was predominantly white. So we had a really adventurous, um, always pushing it theater director. And it was her idea for me to play Jesus. And it worked. And um, I felt really famous, not only just because of the attention of a role like that, but because I was part of something daring that actually worked. Cool. And, away that's one the other one is my dad who never acknowledged any kind of success i had in music until i was in usa today after i opened swing on broadway oh wow. <laughs> and that was it for him he was like oh my god my son is and i wasn't like catching a football or anything <laughs> <laughs> so was he like super excited about your brother's success all the time 
Got it. Okay, I'm there. <laughs> sorry. Did you, sorry you struck a nerve there. <laughs> no, I, I, okay, I got it. Yep. <laughs> it is pretty neat, though. USA Today, I mean. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Maybe he thought you would come farther and he knew he knew. And so when that finally came, he was like, he got to where I wanted him to be. I don't know. I don't you know. know. Yeah. How about you? Me? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to hear the, his answer. <laughs> My one? Um, oh, you. He's talking about you. Thanks. Yeah. God, that's a good one. Is that um, okay to ask that? <laughs> and I asked in this round day. table. You know, I got to be honest. I think I'll pick two moments too. So I ran a phone bank in college, and I was ripping people off, but I was paying for college. And I was a kid. I was twenty years old, and <laughs> and I was like, if they're dumb enough, then screw it. But my parents were not into their dumb enough stuff, and we didn't have money. My dad was a car mechanic, but um, there was some stuff that happened, and I I. So when I started touring, I, my first tour was Stone Temple Pilots. And Scott, I just remember looking at Scott on the stage and then seeing all the other bands that we were playing with because we were doing uh, radio shows in the beginning, all like lined up watching him. And I remember thinking like, wow, I'm getting paid and you guys are watching just because you want to. And I, I knew something was special. But when I looked at the audience, I just saw all these happy people. And I, I felt like this is a this is good. This is cool. So that really was meaningful to me. It was more the audience than the band itself. I really mm. I, I felt like I was part of something healthy rather than the phone bank thing. And then the second one was the book. I, you know, I, I had cancer. And so so <clears throat> I took some time and I wrote the book, but I wrote it because I wanted my nephews to think that their uncle Joel was like a nice, you know, interesting. And so when I finished the book, I, I felt pretty successful because it. I called my buddy, Michael. Michael Grace wrote Poltergeist and Cool World and nice. Walks to Death. He's a real writer. So I called him. I'm like, you know, I'd written a movie before. And I'm like, you know, writing a shitty movie is hard, Michael. But writing a shitty book is so <laughs> fucking hard. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm done. And so I think those were the two moments that I'd be like, man, I'm so happy. <laughs> And then when people liked the book, it was a pleasant surprise, but it was more that I just finished the damn book. <laughs> and it's funny, some of the reviews, you know, this guy came on there and he was saying uh, or that they wrote, a, you know, he should have written more like it didn't end. I'm like, it's 500 pages. You know, how much more crap did you guys want to read? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, there's my win. For what it's worth, there's my answer. Nice. <laughs> nice. Time to think, Rich. What do we got? Yeah. Yeah, well, the thing is, I, I don't feel famous at all. I've never felt famous because to me, I mean, it, and I'm not putting myself down in any way, but this is my job. This is my gig. Um, but if I had to pick some moments, like to where my proudest moments, I would have to say, is um, years ago, uh, this is pre monkeys. So I'm going to say like 2005, maybe I did a production uh, with the Yale repertory company oh, where I was hired as a percussionist, but also an actor. They were doing a production of the comedy of errors and they were doing it very Looney Tune esque. And I got a call to go and talk to the director because they were looking for a percussionist who was also had a flair for acting. And for some reason they picked me. <laughs> so I went and I talked to the director and uh, he's telling me what they're gonna do. He's like, it's kind of like Looney Tunes. You're gonna provide sound effects, but you're also gonna play you know, drums and you're gonna do all this stuff and you're gonna be the only musician. And he, he kind of was getting wrapped around in his speech and he wasn't being very eloquent. And finally he said, okay, do you know who Spike Jones is? And I said, he's one of my heroes. And yeah. he said, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but that's not, oh. that's not the point. The point that I got, uh, that I was super proud was um, the show itself got panned. Like, you know, the local newspapers hated it. The New York Times hated it. But in the New York Times article, they said the highlight of the show 
was the, uh, what was the actual term? Uh, I forget the actual term, but they pinpointed me and said I was, you know, the highlight of the show and I was, the, the, you know, the guy. That was, that was the saving grace of the show. And to me, I was like, I just got written up in the New York Times. And I would go to, to work at night and they'd be like, do you see the review? I'm like, yeah, they said that was great. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's yeah. really my proudest moment ever. And the other is uh, a few years ago, um, Mickey decided he was going to do some symphonic work. He wanted to do Hits of the Monkeys with his band backed by the orchestra. And um, he had some arrangements written up but he asked me to write some of the other arrangements, which I did. And hearing my arrangements played by a symphony orchestra in front of an audience, there's, there's nothing better, man. That, that was, be more, yeah. that was yeah. amazing. <laughs> Especially since I, I think I suck at that, but. <laughs> I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you don't at all. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that was a pretty, so those are the, the two high points in my career. Good not, one. not where I feel famous, but we're, I'm super proud. So anything you can tell us about the upcoming Bon Jovi tour? Is John still in the band? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one last question might be, um, so have you guys had any performances in strange venues or places where something happened that was sort of special, uh, that, that was not expected, you know, stuff like that? Wow. Like not expected in a good way? Hmm. I know you guys have worked with really boring people, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Cindy Lauper. I can't even, that's not even a joke. Can't even pretend. That's a that's a that's an awesome game. No it way. is, it really uh, is. I think my most maybe interesting uh gig was probably the one when we were I was on tour with Bruce Springsteen and we were playing in um in England, in London, and Sir uh, Paul McCartney sat in with us and it would, you know, they have a curfew at night, a noise sort of ordinance. And so it hit, I think, 10 o'clock and they shut off the sound in the middle of Twist and Shout. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> yes, we were playing in, I can't remember the name of the park, it's famous park um, outdoor venue. Oh, um, I think I know. It begins with an H, right? Yes, exactly. That yeah. one. <laughs> it's where uh, Live 8 was. I think that's right, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it was just crazy being on stage with these two huge-ass musicians, and they shut off the sound on them because London's like, just doesn't care who you are. Rules are rules. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So what did he do? Did he kind of look around like you got to be kidding me? Yeah, like the audience stopped clapping and stopped reacting because they couldn't hear anything anymore. To start a riot, you know. <laughs> and John, and then finally, um, Paul and and Bruce looked at each other like, "Oh, we don't have any sound." And Bruce was like, "Really? Are you kidding me? Like in the middle of the <laughs> sound?" You're gonna you do know, what's this? funny too is that the twist and shout is a very short song. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you gotta be. And then who was the guy who flicked the switch? He's like, nope, right? Hey. Rule, you know, we're in England. Rules are rule. <laughs> One more thirty seconds for I'm Mr. McCartney. I'm surprised you guys don't know that story because they circled around the globe a zillion times. I think that was back in in uh, 2000. Was it 12? Maybe I think so. That that happened. It's crazy. It's really, really crazy. It was very, very nice. <laughs> and that's a good one. That's a really good one. That's a really good one. You got any good Nesmith stuff that would be worth mentioning? Well, because he, he just passed and that's really sad. Yeah. But any like moments that are, uh, you know, good positive highlights about him? Yeah, a bunch, especially on this last tour. So what was interesting was uh, going into the farewell tour. Nez's health was not very good. Hmm. The pandemic was not good to him. And uh, he wasn't, we started rehearsals. So what we always do is we, the band rehearses and then one of the guys comes in 
And then the next day, the other guy comes in and then they rehearse together. And Nez didn't come in until the day where him and Mickey rehearsed together. And we were all, first of all, we were all kind of like, this is a long tour. COVID's still around, man. And none of us expected to get through it at the beginning from COVID because we're like, somebody's gonna get sick, some, something's gonna happen. I mean, it was two and a half months on the road. So when Nez did show up, his health was not great. Uh, he was very fragile, very frail. And then our focus went from this tour isn't gonna happen because of COVID to this tour is not gonna last because we don't think Nez is gonna last. Oh, but it was the most amazing thing to see as we kept going he got healthier. It was, you know, it was like the healing power of performance or the healing power of music. It was amazing to see. He oh, put yeah. weight, the color came back in his face. Uh, I mean, if you go online, you can see the first few shows, he's kind of sitting there and his voice is weak. And by the time we hit the Greek three weeks ago, he was full on up and dancing, singing the songs. Uh, so it was amazing. So that was, to me, the greatest thing about that tour was the fact that he went from this frail old man to back to what he was. It was unbelievable. And Nez and I grew extremely closer than we've ever been on this tour than we have in the past. Uh, I've always been close with Mickey. But yeah. Nez and I were, you know, I worked for him and yeah. we would talk every now and again, but this tour was different. He, you know, he was over complimentative about everything and uh, kept saying time and time again, I love working with you. Uh, what a drummer, what an amazing, we're, we're really sounding better than ever. And I watched that rise in him. And that was amazing. Why do you and think he took so many years off or away from the band? Not off. I mean, he was doing stuff, I'm sure. He, in my opinion. Yeah, opinion, of course. Very yeah. conflicted uh, because he wanted to be known as Nesmith the songwriter, not Nesmith the monkey. Oh. And he did come to prominence as the monkey. I mean, overnight they became, you know, world famous. But he had this whole other body of work. You know, he played with the first national band he put together and then the second national band. And then he did all this stuff on, as a solo artist and then, you know, pioneered music video. I mean, pretty much invented MTV. And I think he it was wanted because to they like, they were really good at speeding up the camera. So it looked like those guys were on top of their shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Man, those guys could load that yeah. car quick. <laughs> yeah. And he was really, I think he above all the others was really affected by the whole, they don't, they don't play their own instruments bit. Oh. Because, you know, they were thrown together. They're the original boy band. If you think of it that way. Wow. And, but then they became a band. They yeah. took the reins and became a band because Nesmith wanted to play. He didn't want to just be the actor that played. And his songwriting is, is solid. He has a couple songs on the first album, a couple songs on the second album. And then, you know, he wrote different drum for Linda Ronstadt. And then, you know, Joanne was a big hit for him. So he wanted to be known as that guy, not... I think he thought it was gimmicky. I mean, I don't want to sound negative. Yeah. He, he never do. really got it. Um, and not to tell stories out of school, but there was a, an after party one year after a tour was over. And there were these two uh, female lawyers that he was talking to at the party. And he couldn't understand how well-educated people could enjoy the monkeys. Oh. He felt it, it's a kid's show. It's for, you know, not people who would appreciate good. Music. I'd hate to think what he thinks of this Three Stooges then. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> but he just didn't get it. And on this tour, that was another thing. He understood it. He really came to appreciate what was so special about the monkeys. And there was That's one great. moment every night where we did this song. It was kind of an obscure song from a later album called While I Cry. And he would tell this story of how he finally got it. He understood that these people, these kids were sitting in their basements listening to Monkeys records because that's what made them feel special. Mm, yeah, that's what yeah. gave them, cool. you know, entertainment. And I think he, he, you know, left the tour and left this world finding a whole new appreciation for that and really coming to terms with it. 
I hope it's true. It sounds, I mean, it'd be a good way to go out. You know, we all got to go. We all got to go. And yeah, you know, other than maybe the die during sex, which might be too crude. <laughs> um, <laughs> what better yeah. way to go than playing the music? Die right? happy, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really great. Thank you for sharing that, man. That was a cool moment. I appreciate it. So I think I'll let us go because Everett needs to get to Bon Jovi rehearsal, man. Yeah, bon Jovi rehearsal. Yeah, Everett, <laughs> need to get to work. It was a pleasure, both of you. Nice to be here, man. And Joel, yes. Thank you for the hang. That was a lot of fun. Absolutely. I look forward to talking to you guys both soon. And thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or the guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle's Joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, don't be a dick.